Hello, and welcome to our exclusive call with Dr. Michael Faki, the chairman and group medical director at Faki Fertility Center. My name is Cassie Destino. I am the founder of IVF Support UAE and your host for this call. Many of you will be very familiar with Dr. Faki. He's been a leader in the field of IVF for over 30 years and is easily one of the most recognizable and well-respected names in fertility care in the UAE. He is responsible for over 35,000 IVF deliveries, which is incredible. He is truly a pioneer in the field, and I am so happy that he is joining us today. Dr. Fakie, welcome. Thank you so much for, for your time this evening. Thank you for this beautiful introduction. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Um, so there's a couple of things I'd like to focus on today. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I wonder if you could start by talking about the recent changes in the IVF law here in the UAE. Could you give us an update on those? Yes. Yeah, so the most significant changes started happening about uh, uh, four years ago when they were allowing uh, egg freezing in single women. So that was significant. And at the same time, they changed the law from prohibiting frozen embryos to you can freeze embryos now. So like four years ago, you could not freeze embryos and you had to have a special permission. So these are two things that happened few years ago. But now this year, uh, a big leap forward happened when they allowed unmarried couples to actually have an IVF baby. And all that's required is to go to your embassy and register that this baby will be under your, um, uh, basically, you, you take care of that baby and you can go ahead and do the IVF procedure. So either partner will register the baby under his name or her name and uh, give them the citizenship that they would like to have. So if somebody is Bulgarian married to a uh, Japanese, then they will say, okay, this child will be Bulgarian and um, they'll go to the Bulgarian embassy and register uh, under the um, Bulgarian laws. So um, that basically was a good uh, thing to happen because many, many couples basically wanted to do this and they were not legally married. And as you know, like in the US and Europe, um, this is a natural thing happening and you don't even have to have any paperwork done between the couple to register any child. So um, more recently, there's been some talk about legalizing surrogacy. And I think the um, state of Abu Dhabi is the lead in this. Um, and my last discussion with them, uh, they practically allow it somehow in, in Abu Dhabi with special permission, but not in the other states yet. So if you have a problem with the uterus, you cannot carry a baby, there's a chance if you apply uh, in Abu Dhabi, you'll be able to get the surrogate there. Really? Okay, I didn't, I, I was under the impression that that was just not on the table, that somehow that was a mistake, that it had gotten into the press, that there was just no surrogacy. Uh, well, it's not really a mistake. I know about it. I saw the law and I read it and I uh, basically approved it too. Um, oh. And I helped them write it. So it is a fact. It uh, is in the works. But my understanding is not all the different uh, parts of the union will, um, will approve it. Uh, it will at least the state of Abu Dhabi will approve this but you still need the special permission to be able to do it from the uh, Department of Health. I see, okay, that's interesting. Um, so for now, are the clinics ready for this? Is this law enacted? Is it, is it, is it live? How, I mean, if you, how does it work? Are you ready to start taking unmarried couples? Yeah, we are, already are. Um, the process is very simple. Uh, what will take is a paper from the embassy that um, they're, they're okay with this and uh, we just go ahead and do it. Um, so it'll be just like any other uh, IVF procedure done with, with the married couples. Okay, interesting. I, I my, my understanding was that it was a little bit more complex and there were several steps of paperwork and attestations and things like that. But... No, it's not, it's really very simple. The other thing that really happened um, recently and is allowed is actually transportation of gametes and embryos across the borders. So a few years ago, this was not allowed. Now they're allowing it. 
So if you have embryos, let's say frozen in Belgium, you can uh, bring them over to Dubai and vice versa. If you have embryos in Dubai, you can send them over to UK or to the UK or to the US. Um, so it's allowed, you can send sperm, you can send uh, eggs uh, or embryos, uh, or you can receive those too. Okay, that's that's really good because we have a lot of women on the group who are not married. They're not necessarily interested in IVF right now, but they are interested in freezing their eggs. And I know that that's a big concern about what, okay, I've frozen my eggs in, in, in Dubai or in Abu Dhabi, now what? What, what if I wanna use them in five years back in England? That's going to be, that's, that's an easy enough process. Yeah, so this is a very common question that I get asked is, um, can we transport them overseas and how long can we freeze them for? Yeah. So basically there's no time limit on how long you can freeze the, the eggs or embryos um, or sperm. Uh, they, it's a five-year rule. So basically you can renew this every five years and uh, practically you can freeze it as long as you're alive. There's no uh, law saying that you cannot. Um, you cannot donate those eggs or those sperm to anybody else, but if you move them to another country where uh, it can be donated, it's, it's your choice. Yeah. But in the UAE, you cannot donate uh, gametes or you cannot receive donated gametes here. Right. Um, and, and, or, yeah. So do you think that that might be something that someday will be acceptable here? Well, it is looking at the landscape and what's happening, uh, what's happened over the past two years uh, in the UAE, it seems that it might become possible in certain groups of people. I don't think it will be universal. It will probably just affect uh, certain uh, religions or sects right. uh, and not uh, the UAE citizens. So they might just uh, remove that part from this. Okay, that is great. That's really good information. Thank you so much. Um, when I announced that I was going to have this call with you, I asked if anyone had questions and I got a lot of questions. Um, and one question that I got a couple of different ways, uh, and I've also noticed from monitoring the group and seeing what's getting talked about on the group, is um, members who have had uh, failed IVFs after transferring healthy, highly graded, genetically tested embryos and sort of everything looked good. Everything went well and then they didn't get pregnant and everybody was surprised. Um, can you talk a little bit about what are the kinds of things that, that may have gone wrong in that case or what can we do the next time when we've had that experience of transferring these, these really high quality embryos and not getting pregnant. What, what can we learn from that? What do we know? Sure, so it can be a multifaceted uh, reason like why uh, you put back a normal embryo and it doesn't attach, okay? So the first thing that comes to mind is the, the area that the, or the environment you're implanting the embryo in is not healthy. Um, some, some women might have like a chronic endometritis, for instance, where there's inflammation in the lining of the uterus that they've never really diagnosed. It's very simple to diagnose this either with a swab or with a hysteroscopy. So if you do if you do have this uh, issue, th then um, it's very easy to treat it. Okay. Another reason might also be local or localized to the endometrium, which might be a adhesions or scar tissue, or sometimes what we call Asherman syndrome. But if you have a good physician following you, they should be able to diagnose. Yeah. yeah. Another reason might might be like a fallopian tube that's inflamed and that has uh, a chronic infection with some fluid seeping back into the endometrial cavity and killing the embryos. All right. So these are basically the most common reasons why an embryo will not implant. But uh, practically, you, your physician or your embryologist can tell you this is a high grade embryo, but it really is not. So you have to, excuse me, at least get a, a photo of the embryo and show it to an expert to tell you if this really looks like a really good embryo or not, because there are many different parts of the embryo that get different grades, and uh, you need to have a very good inner cell mass to have a baby at the end. So if the inner cell mass volume is low, then it's not a good embryo, even though it might be looking like a crystal ball 
and rounded, beautiful, no, no uh, vacuolation, no degeneration in the embryo. So uh, you have to question the fact that this is a really good embryo <clears throat> with diagnostic being given to you. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing. <clears throat> Other issue is if you're saying that this is a genetically tested embryo, the question is what type of genetic test was done in the embryo? The most common test that we're doing is what we call PGTA, or it's a pre-genetic diagnosis in the embryo that looks at aneuploidy. Aneuploidy means abnormal chromosome numbers. So if you have trisomy 21, then it will show with this test, which is the most common uh, abnormality that you can find. Monosomies are not compatible with life. So if you have one, one chromosome that's missing, you will not get pregnant, except if it's a sex chromosome. So um, these are the most common problems that you see. But what's really more important than all of this is a test that is available, but women and men are not really doing that test, which is the carrier screening test. So this is a test which will check your um, genetic makeup and tell us if you're carrying any disease that can be transmitted to your offspring or to the embryo. And if you share the same disease with your um, husband or with your partner, then this embryo uh, will, will be affected with that particular disease. There are some issues with embryos which are not compatible with life. So I just saw a patient yesterday where the genetic test showed that the male cannot have sperm, okay? But at the same time, the same gene is embryo toxic. So it can kill the embryo itself. So basically that embryo will never make it to, to become a human being. Mm. It has two problems. One is the uh, ability to form sperm, but same time the embryo itself will stop dividing. So if we're talking about a normal embryo that reaches the blastocyst stage, then obviously there's no uh, stoppage in the development and you have to look for localized uh, problems. One thing that is overlooked uh, is also what you call chronic inflammation. So chronic inflammation can basically poison your whole body fluids. So if you put your embryo inside a chronically inflamed body, then the environment is not compatible with the long life. You might end up with a chemical pregnancy or maybe an empty sac or a very early miscarriage in these, in these situations. And how do we diagnose this? There's some tests that we can do which will reflect the chronic inflammation. One of them is the actual ovarian reserve. So if a woman is 30, you expect her AMH level, which is anti hormone, to be over 2.5. If there's less than one, then most likely she is chronically inflamed, and that's why her ovarian reserve is low. So that's one indicator or one sign that tells us there is chronic inflammation. Other tests, one includes, like we can check, the total oxidative stress level, so TOS, we call it. If your oxidation level is high, then this means that you're chronically inflamed. If you have high clotting factors, then you're chronically inflamed. If you have antibodies, then chronically inflamed. If you have Crohn's disease, thyroid antibodies, uh, diabetes, hypertension, there must be chronic inflama inflammation. So where do we diagnose this and who are the best people to, to really uh, evaluate you for chronic inflammation. And we say that these are the integrative functional doctors who we have quite a few here in Dubai that can help uh, the, make the diagnosis and treatment. And last week, uh, I had a patient who um, had the most horrible embryos. Uh, she had four IVF procedures done in the UK. And all every single time that she had the procedure done, her embryos were not in it blastocyst state, what early transfer and she didn't get pregnant. So she came and we made diagnosis of uh, mold infestation in, in that pe person and some heavy metal uh, levels that were higher than they should. And she got treatment for this over three months. And then we repeated the inflammation markers and all of them were back to normal with the IV procedure. And she ended up with uh, an early pregnancy now. So um, this happens, it, it can be a reason why the embryo doesn't implant. And uh, it's relatively common, especially in, in countries where you have uh, issues with the environment, okay? So if there's pollution, um, then you will tend to have a chronic inflammation. And this, this is a real problem in, in the UAE. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, so, so some of those things might be able to be caught before a transfer, uh, some of the kind of physical things that maybe show up on a scan. But for some of these other ones, it really is sort of a case of you have to have the failed transfer and then do these investigations. Would, would you consider doing any of these investigations for someone before they've ever had a transfer, before you might even know that there was an issue? This is an amazing question, and it really means a lot because the philosophy is if you go ahead and do an IVF procedure and you have one of these diagnoses, you're going to lose at least 25,000 dirham. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's, it's wasted. If you try to do the testing, it might cost you about five or six or 7,000. Okay, but it's, a, it's the best investment you've made in, into an IVF procedure. So I encourage patients to do those tests, especially the whole exome sequencing and the chronic inflammation testing, plus a good ultrasound to make sure that the uterus is normal, or maybe even a hysteroscopy, which is usually covered by insurance. So if all of this is done, uh, and then you still need to do the IVF, then you can proceed and do it. Uh, and you rest assured that your success rate will be very good if you end up with a good embryo. Yeah. Okay, so one other thing that you really look uh, have to look at is the lifestyle. Um, you, you have different types of people in the UAE <clears throat> with different lifestyles. <clears throat> you have the obese and you have the very slim, all right? You have the athletic and you have somebody who stays home watching Netflix the whole time. Um, you have the active and the inactive uh, the people who drink alcohol every day and smoke every day and those that don't. So all of this will affect your metabolism and anything that affects metabolism can create a metabolic disorder that can affect your embryos, namely your egg and sperm and then the embryo. So the advice that I give almost everyone now is you have to at least walk 10,000 steps a day. You have to be active. Mm -hmm. The other very valuable advice is to you, you should really sleep eight hours continuously every night. Okay, it has to be a night sleep and not the day sleep. So sleeping at night, walking uh, daily, and also look at your diet, what you're eating. Sometimes you might have uh, some inflammation from gluten or from dairy products. You should avoid these things and there's testing to do that will tell us if you have those allergies. Uh, you have to avoid eating sugar. Um, you have to really not eat at night time. And it's very common in Dubai to go out at 10 p.m. and then have a dinner and then go back home at midnight and sleep. All of this is not healthy. So we really have to avoid these bad lifestyle habits uh, and this will reduce inflammation. So obesity has to be treated. Now we're lucky enough to have the, all these new medications that can help you uh, lose the weight. Uh, I know like it might be taboo in some people's mind, but uh, I've seen many, many uh, men and women who have really benefited from these new medications like Ozempic and, and Manjaro. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a single injection per week. It reduces your appetite. It works mostly on your brain. So it reduces the satiety center, especially the uh, Monjaro. Uh, and it's actually good for addictive personalities. So if you're addicted to, let's say, alcohol, your alcohol intake will be reduced. And now some physicians are advising alcoholic uh, people to take the Monjaro because it reduces your alcohol intake. You will not feel like you want to drink anymore. Uh, and you might even want to puke when you when you when you uh, drink the alcohol. So there's some benefit besides the weight loss. And since we're talking about this, I know this is, as you say, something of a controversial subject, and some people think it's great and some people don't. Do you feel very comfortable with its side effects with pregnancy, with fertility? If someone's been taking Ozempic or Manjaro and then they get pregnant, do they need to stop it? How? Do, what, what do we know about uh, fetal development after taking these medications? Okay, again, another amazing question. So, uh, okay, so let's let's take an example of a woman who is 100 kilos, all right, or 220 pounds, that comes to your clinic and wants to get pregnant. All right, you do some testing, she's pre-diabetic, hemoglobin A1C is high. So what would you do with this woman? She says, I cannot uh, not eat, I love to eat, I go out every night, I would like to have a drink. So would you do an IVF procedure on this woman or not? You can do it, but the problem is she might end up with hypertension, preeclampsia, preterm labor, eruption membranes, uh, abruption of placenta, and so on and so forth, which will give you a very unhealthy baby at the end. 
But if you put them on this product for at least like three to six months before you actually do the IVF procedure, and then wait maybe a couple of months for the effect to, to wane, then you can safely do an IVF procedure, okay? Now, the other thing you can do is you can actually freeze their embryos and then treat their problem, okay? So there's nothing wrong with like making the egg, getting the sperm, fertilizing it, and then checking the embryo, make sure that genetically normal and then freeze it, okay? And then six months down the road when she's healthy, you go ahead and do the transfer. And this way you basically will definitely have a healthy baby. All right, so, but if you, on the other hand, go back and just transfer the embryo to an obese woman who is diabetic and who's not really taking good care of herself and not, uh, she's smoking and she's not uh, walking every day, let's say, or is not sleeping well at night, most likely she will end up with complications in pregnancy. Mm. So she's defeating the purpose of having a baby and she end up with a handicapped baby that will give her a hard time in her, her life. And he would be like in a very bad shape too. So it's really important to look at the whole context of what we really want from, from the IVF procedure. Is it just a pregnancy or is it healthy pregnancy? Is it a, a baby or just a healthy baby? So there's ways now to really assure you that your pregnancy will you'll carry to term and this will be a genetically healthy baby when it's born. And if somebody is interested in seeking that kind of treatment, do they talk to you about it? Do they need to find an endocrinologist? How, how do you manage that care? Yes. Yeah, so let's say that you work in an IVF clinic and there's no endocrinologist or there's no GP or family medicine physician or internal medicine who is with patients. There's many doctors in town that you can refer to. You can have a rapport with one or two of these doctors. So like there is a feedback from them whenever you send them a, a patient and you make sure that you don't lose this patient. Um, so we, in our center, we do have those uh, physicians around and we have do the functional medicine doctors, we have the uh, internists and we have the nutritionist and uh, we have the lifestyle uh, gurus that will really help you with, uh, with your lifestyle changes. So um, this is, and then we also have a very comprehensive genetic lab. Mm -hmm. All of this is really a prerequisite to have a healthy pregnancy and then end up with a healthy baby at the end. So speaking of that, I, I'll, I'll just ask you this and then I'll, I'll let you go because this sort of folds in lots of some of the other questions that I've received uh, before our call tonight. If somebody wants to have an IVF, they know they're going to need an IVF, but they haven't started yet. What do you think they need to do? They're going to come into your office. They're going to say, I'm just not, I'm not getting pregnant. I really want to have a baby. What do they need to do before they start? It sounds like you've got some ideas about some testing they can do, some counseling they should have. What's a kind of general, I want to have an IVF in five months. What do I do today? What would you suggest? Okay, so it really depends on the reason why they're not getting pregnant. Let's say that there's a problem with the sperm, okay? And then this, the, the husband has gone through a lot of treatment and his sperm count is still low and the motility is low. So you're like, you, you have to use the sperm. This is, there's no other alternative. So then the, this woman, if she is healthy herself with good lifestyle, you can just go ahead and then start the IVF procedure. But if she herself is obese, um, has irregular cycles, uh, pre-diabetic, then we have to really deal with all these issues. And the first thing we do now in our clinic is, uh, besides uh, like looking at the overall picture, is do the whole exome sequencing test or what you call the carrier screening test to make sure that this, this couple really does not carry any disease that be transmitted to the child. Or to the body. So it's a multifaceted thing. It's not just one thing you look at. Uh, you have to look at the whole picture, like you'll examine the, the woman, you'll make sure that the uterus is normal, there are no adhesions inside the cavity, like there's no fibroids that are impinging on the cavity, there's no polyps, uh, that she doesn't have any tubal obstruction, there's no hydrosapings or fluid in the tube, many, many things that you really have to rule out from the, those visits. And then you decide on when is she a good candidate for the IVF, like maybe she can get pregnant on her own if she really changed her lifestyle, if she loses weight. Uh, if the sugar levels come down, if she sleeps well at night or eats proper diet. And I've seen many, many women who don't really have to do IVF. You can just modify the lifestyle, help them with the nutritionist, 
and the, the eating habits, and this by itself can reverse the fertility issue and they can get pregnant. So don't always have to spend the, the big money for the IVF procedure. There's so many things you can do before IVF that will increase the chance for pregnancy. But are the extremes diagnosis were like, you're over 40, you don't have much time to waste, then you probably go ahead and freeze your embryos and then think about um, the, your lifestyle changes because then you'll be healthier and you'll be able to carry the pregnancy term. So there's so many things that will come to, like it depends on what the the other, the patients look like and uh, what uh, health status they're in, what the, the issues are. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of women now who are younger with a very low AMH. AMH mm -hmm. is the ovarian reserve. And again, there's many, many, many reasons why this is low. And then I, I mentioned to you a few minutes ago on how we can really help uh, bring the AMH up. But let's say that you're in a place where you cannot bring your AMH up. So it might be wise to go ahead and freeze your eggs or freeze the embryos and then deal with the AMH level. Okay, because as an IVF doctor, my number one enemy is the woman's age. Mm. Once you hit 40 and above, then your success rate goes down. Not because of the uterus, it's because the incidence of anomalies or abnormalities in the embryo are very high at this age group. And you have more uh, trisomies, more unemployed embryos, and so on and so forth. So uh, you really have to think about freezing your eggs at an earlier age. Uh, the most ideal age is about 35. Doing an AMH level in most clinics is for free, and at most it will cost 100 dirham. It's it's good to go and, and do the AMH level to just see what the levels are, what the prognosis is for, for the next two or three years. So if your AMH is three or four, then I think you're safe for at least two or three years. Yeah. You don't have to really be uh, uh, antsy about doing it right away. If it is under two, then you have to really think about freezing your eggs. So to avoid getting to the age of 40, 41, 42 without having a child or frozen embryo, my advice is to freeze them at an early stage. If you freeze an embryo, it's probably better than freezing an egg. But if there's no partner, you might as well just freeze your eggs and then see what happens later on. Well, you know, one thing that you've said that that really resonates with me that I'm really appreciative of you saying is that the goal isn't pregnancy. The goal is healthy pregnancy. The goal is healthy babies. It's, you know, we're trying to start a journey that that is parenthood. And, you know, IVF is just the beginning. And then there's this whole lifetime of parenthood you have to do. And so it's so important that we are looking at our overall health, not just getting pregnant, but staying pregnant and delivering a healthy baby and parenting a healthy child. And I know so many Faki babies, and I just want to thank you so much for your dedication to our community and to the women and families in our community and for your time this evening. It was full of really great information. I really do appreciate it. And uh, as always, our members can reach out to you directly. They can reach out to me and I can put them in touch with someone from Saki if you would like to book an appointment. You have a Dubai branch, you have an Abu Dhabi branch, uh, you know, you're really kind of covering your bases here in the UAE. So thank you, doctor. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure to speak with you and I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks a lot. Always a pleasure. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.